Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. 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 Such a kind and generous welcome, and I'm deeply grateful. And uh, the very fact that we're here tonight, uh, the night before Easter, uh, the fact that we're in a church, uh, the fact that we're going to talk about politics, among other things, uh, there's a confluence of factors and subjects and topics that I think uh, make for some very rich conversation. And so I'm grateful to be here with you, and like I said, honored that you would come. You know, in medieval Europe, the church was always at the center of the village. And then all of the other streets would radiate out from the church. It was the idea that the church was the center of things, that religion was the center of things, and everything else was an expression and an extension of that faith. In modern, certainly modern Western society, religion, spirituality, are just one category out of many. Now, some of you might know me from my work with A Course in Miracles and so forth, that sort of aspect of my work. And we've talked often about the fact that spirituality should not be seen as simply another category of your life, separate from the others. But rather, it should be central because it underlies everything else. Spirituality, particularly in a sense of the mystical, is the path of the heart. And everything that we do, everything that we think, every aspect of life that is an extension of the heart is something that ultimately works for us. It's not about good or bad or should or shouldn't. It's simply the way life operates. Where there is love, there is greater harmony, there is greater peace, there's a greater alignment with that which is natural and true to our being. We have developed a modern society in which not only is the path of the heart peripheralized, it is actually in many ways denigrated. It is superseded by many of the factors, particularly economic factors, that dominate our modern existence. We have made economics, rather than love, our new god. We are living at a time where instead of an economic system serving the people, the people are basically serving an economic system. Money is not God. Money, however, has become in our society a false god. The way we relate as a society to an economic system has superseded right relationship with society, right relationship with government, right relationship with nature, right relationship with other countries. And what could be a better night and what could be a better place than for us to think deeply about how we have swerved from what is truly the natural order of being human on this planet. Once we do rethink all this, then everything will be fine. But until we rethink, we rethink all this, we will continue on a trajectory of chaos and decline. Now, when we look at our country particularly, that's our piece of the garden. You know, these days it's become so, um, uh, so prevalent that we are focused on our color, we're focused on our ethnicity, we're focused on our sex, our sexuality, our religion, and so forth. Those things are important. I'm not saying this in any way to minimize that. But I remind you of an element um, in uh, alchemy. And that is the idea that all of the separate elements are separated out. It's called separatio, so that they can be perfected. And the point of their being perfected is so that they can join together at a higher level. What's happening now is that we are concentrating so much on the separate elements, and then we decry the separation, although so many times we hold to the separation in our own minds. 
So I'm not speaking to you tonight as a black American, a white American, a brown American, a Jewish American, a Hindu American, a Muslim American, a Christian American, an agnostic American, a gay American, a straight American, a binary. That's, that's, that's got its own importance. But I'm talking to you tonight as an American. And I'm talking to you tonight as, as a human being. We've got to come out of our silos for a particular conversation that is necessary at this time. Because after all of those separate elements, when you talk about these things, there's a hyphen. Jewish American, Muslim American, Black American. And I'd like to talk to you tonight as my fellow Americans. Now, we know, thank you very much. <clears throat> Who you think you are goes a long way towards determining what you think you're supposed to do. And one of the reasons people live in this, this sense of chaos today, I don't know who I am, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. We're all looking for grounding. And in our personal lives, we find our grounding a lot by looking into our family experience. Whether you go to therapy or whatever your experience of individuation calls for. Who were my parents and who were my people? Where did this all start? What's the history of this particular group with which I identify? So I'd like to start tonight by looking at the particular group which is American. How did this whole thing start? And if we look at where it all started, what clues does this give us about where we are now? Now, I also mentioned at the beginning how interesting that this is the night before Easter, because this is relevant to our conversation tonight as well. There's only one truth, I believe, and it's spoken in many different ways. No matter who the great religious figures are, the great religious stories of the world, they are like coded messages from the divine mind to humanity. Now, the story of Easter is a particularly powerful one, obviously. In the Christian, not just the Christian religion, but in the story of Christ, which many of us relate to outside a doctrinal or doct uh, doctrinaire identification of a particular religion. Christmas and Easter are the two existential bookends that hold the whole story together. Christmas is the idea that in any given moment where there is a humble thought of pure love, something new is born into the world, something more powerful than the powers of the world. Easter is the recognition that the world as it is now constituted is not gonna like that, and that there are forces within this world that not only are devoid of love, but being devoid of love actually will seek to destroy love. The joy of Easter is the idea that love will always have the final say. Now we're going to apply that a little bit tonight to the founding of our country and to the history of our country. Let's go back to 1776. 1776, some very brave men, 56 of them as a matter of fact, they got together and they signed a document. And doing so was very brave on their part because if the British had won the war, all 56 of them would have been executed as traitors. Now, as, signing, as signers of that document, they infused not only into the founding of this country, but into the political and, in fact, into the spiritual and moral ethers of the planet, a possibility that had never existed before. They infused ideals, not actualities, ideals, aspirations. And there are four which are particularly important. The Declaration of Independence is America's vision statement. It's our North Star. John Adams said he hoped we would revisit our first principles every July 4th. If these principles are simply inscribed on marble walls somewhere, if they are written on parchments and they're under glass in a museum in Washington, and when our kids are in the eighth grade, we send them on a trip to see it, those things of themselves will not do the job. Those principles must be inscribed in our hearts, and they must be inscribed generation after generation, or they lose their moral force. Uh, in the Jewish religion, it says that every generation must rediscover God for itself. And as Americans, every generation must rediscover the power, the point, and I believe the radicalism of the Declaration of Independence. If we don't, 
They lose their moral force, they lose their life force, and we become easy to play. And that is what exactly has happened over the last 50 years. We have been played. So let's revisit those principles right now. First of all, all men are created equal. That was radical and relevant, obviously, in 1776. It's radical and relevant today. Secondly, that all men are endowed by our creator with the inalienable rights of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, which I think in today's terms, we would call that self-actualization. You have the right. You have the right just by being the virtue of being human. Go, do it, whatever you want to do, as long as you don't hurt anyone else. You have that right. To be who you want to be, do whatever you want to do, literally that makes you happy. Third, that governments are instituted to secure those rights. Not to chip away at those rights, not to diminish those rights, not to limit those rights. That government is instituted to secure those rights. Radical in 1776 and radical today. Number four is most radical of all. If government is not doing that job, it is the right of the people to alter it or to abolish it. Radical then and radical now. <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln said that the Declaration of Independence was an eternal rebuke to all forces of tyranny and oppression, but only if we own it. Now, that's where it all started. It was a burst of light. You know, the Course in Miracles says enlightenment is burst of light. Light is understanding. Yes, it was a great burst of light, hope, and possibility for humanity, but we're not stupid nor uneducated. We also know that in that moment, in that beginning, it was also very gnarly because 41 of the 56 were themselves slave owners. Now, that is our story. We have always been, we have been from the beginning, we have been in every generation, and we are now both and. We have always been both and. We have been the best that humanity has to offer, and we have been the worst that humanity has to offer. Understanding, understanding that dichotomy, understanding that almost bipolar aspect of the American mind, understanding the struggle that lies inherent in that fact and that is reiterated generation after generation after generation gives us deep insight to where we are now. Now, every generation has played that out, but some more dramatically than others. So how did other generations do? When you look at how other generations did, very impressively, thank you. You know, we're living at a time where some people have no listening for what America has done wrong, what needs to be corrected. But I think there are other people in this uh, country who make the uh, just as, as uh, false, um, have just as big an error in their thinking. They only want to look at what we've done right and they have no listening, I mean, only want to look at what we've done wrong and have no listening for what we've done right. The truth is, the struggle has always been with us and generations of Americans have prevailed in the cause of justice and righteousness and love over and over and over again. Yes, we had slavery in this country. What do we also have? Abolition, the Civil War, and constant institutional amendments that abolish the institution. Yes, we had the institutionalized suppression of women in this country. We also had generations that rose up with the women's suffrage movement and the establishment of the 19th Amendment. We had the Gilded Age, what is now recognized as the first Gilded Age, in which financial inequities were infused into the way America operated. And our, our uh, ancestors responded to that with the establishment of organized labor. 
We also had the institutionalized suppression of black people in the American South in the form of segregation. And we had a generation that rose up with the Civil Rights Movement, desegregated the American South, passed the Voting Rights Act, and passed the Civil Rights Act. I've been running for president for the last one year because it's our turn now. simply living through the, the next, the present iteration of the same old story, filled with people whose hearts are ablaze with the importance of what this whole thing is supposed to be about. People who throughout our history have recognized this is big, this Declaration of Independence stuff, this liberty and justice for all stuff. And it gives us two very important things. It gives us rights that are extremely profound, extremely profound, but it also gives us responsibilities that are deeply profound. A responsibility to protect those ideals, to protect them in our time. This isn't just about us. This is about their world historic importance. This is about honoring our ancestors and knowing what we owe to our own descendants. It's about being willing to rebuke, as Lincoln said, all assaults on these democratic ideals. But what we're living through, as every generation of America has lived through in its own time since the very beginning, we are filled with forces, as others have been, willing to struggle, willing to sacrifice, and in other generations have shown that they were willing to die to protect those ideals. And yet, we're faced with forces who for their own ideological and or financial purposes put their property rights above human rights and were willing to do whatever it took, no matter how atrocious and how heinous, to make sure that those ideals in fact were not fully actualized because that affected their bottom line. Other generations have said, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. It's time for us to say, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. generations knew what they were dealing with, and they were dealing with specific institutional realities. And so you could think of those realities as like operable tumors. Slavery, you knew what you had to do, abolish it. Institutionalized oppression of women, you knew what you had to do, pass the 19th Amendment, and so forth. Ours is more complicated. It's more like a cancer that has already metastasized. It's not one particular institution, it's an economic paradigm which has gotten hold of our society, which now has tentacles in every sector of American life. It is the very idea, all it is is an idea, but it's an idea to which our government itself owes obeisance. Yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. Your short term profits, you corporate overlords, shall be allowed to take precedence over the safety and the health and the well-being of the American people, over the safety and the health and the well-being of the planet, over the safety and the health and the well-being of other people in the world, if it serves your bottom line, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. It's our turn to make that clear. And in making that clear, Today, it's a matrix of corporate overlords. It's insurance companies, it's pharmaceutical companies, it's big food companies, it's big chemical companies, it's big oil companies, it's big agricultural companies, it's gun manufacturers, and it is defense contractors. And at this point, especially since the Citizens United Supreme Court decision 14 years ago, they have unlimited permission to have undue influence over the way our government operates. Such is their power to financially and undue influence. Actually pick and choose who they want to actually run this country to the point where they have held Washington hostage. At this point, they have turned Washington itself into a system of legalized bribery. 
Now remember that I speak to you from inside the belly of the beast. I speak to you as someone who's actually been running for president for one year. And you know, I used to think that the problem we had is the political parties were chopping wood and carrying water for huge corporate forces. Now I realize it's even worse than that. They are huge corporate forces. They are part of the matrix. <laughs> now knowing your American history is very helpful at this time. It was George Washington in his farewell address who warned us about the undue influence of political parties. He said that they could become factions of men who were more loyal to their party than to their country. And John Adams said, President John Adams said that he saw them as the greatest threat to democracy. Because what happens now is that we have formed in our time, or allowed to form, a political elite which didn't even exist in those days, or at least was not supposed to exist. The idea that there is a group of people who considered themselves qualified to lead this country. I remind you where they have led us to. They have led us to six inches from the cliff. They have led us to a state of permanent crisis. It's always something. Our democracy is in crisis. Our environment is in crisis. Our economy is in crisis. People's health is in crisis. People's mental health is in crisis. And yet their idea of qualified is someone qualified to perpetuate the system as it is. And the system as it is is predicated on the idea that is extremely aristocratic, that is actually a reversion to the very aristocratic, aristocratic situation that we repudiated in 1776. We repudiated it in 1776, and it's time to repudiate it again. <laughs> Now, don't y'all forget now, I'm the kooky one. I'm the woo-woo one. I'm the unserious one. So they character assassinate anyone who doesn't uh, suit their purposes of towing the line of the agenda that they want everybody to fall in line and make sure that we adhere to. And I think all of us have to look at how easily, not only how we have been played over the last 50 years, but at this point, how easily we are played. Nothing that I'm going to say to you tonight should be considered in any way radical, except in the best sense of the word. The Declaration of Independence is radical. Everything I'm saying to you tonight is actually what is traditionally American. The traditional establishment politicians today they should be considered fringe. They are the ones who represent an aberrational chapter of American history. And what I submit to you is that it's time for us to cut the cord with that aberrational chapter of history, American history, neoliberal economics, and so forth. <laughs> I'm going to get a little intergenerational here, and I'm going to talk to those of you who are young. Now, those of you who are young, I want to describe a far away, long ago, and far away land to you. It's going to probably seem like almost impossible, but actually, I'm sure you intellectually know that it exists. For those of you who are older, like myself, I'd like you to remember this land, and I know that you will be nodding your head going, oh, well, she's right, it's true. So for those of you who are young, I'm going to describe this long ago and faraway land. It was called the 1970s. <laughs> you ready? The average American couple could afford a house. The average American couple could afford a car. The average American couple could afford a yearly vacation. The average American couple, if they wanted, one parent could stay home with the kids. The average American couple lived a life where one salary could afford to support a family of four, and that average American couple could afford to send their kids to college. That was called a thriving middle class. You cannot have a thriving democracy where you do not have a thriving middle class. Blood has to circulate in the body. 
Blood has to circulate in the body the same way wealth and wealth creation opportunity has to circulate in a civilization. If you have all the blood in your body in one arm, the body will be extremely unhealthy. And if you have all the opportunity, whether it's easy access to healthcare, easy access to higher education, easy access to economic opportunity, only prescribed within the limits of a relatively small group of Americans, you do not have the opportunity for a thriving democracy. And that is what we have today. We have a collapsed middle class. We are at the tail end of a fifth, well, let's hope we're at the tail end. We're gonna be at the tail end if you and I demand that we're at the tail end. We are at the point, however, where there has been a 50 year transfer of wealth to the tune of $50 trillion from the bottom 90% of Americans to the top 1%. $50 trillion. Now, <laughs> I love it, ooh, okay, woo, <laughs> okay. So the first principle of the United States that is relevant here is that government is meant to play the part of broker. We, government is meant to balance individual liberty, and that should include economic liberty with a concern for the common good. That is what is referred to in the preamble to the Constitution, the common good good. And so the, what would that mean? That would mean, well, if you want to build a factory downriver, good for you. Good for you. That's great. You get to establish your dreams, actualize you know, your own potential. You'll, you'll hire people. That's the high side of the market. Good for you. However, if you are spewing toxins into the river that have a carcinogenic effect on the people who live there, it is the role of the government to say, stop right there. However, we are living at a time where instead of our being able to reasonably assume that the government is going to say stop right there if in fact that, that uh, factory is spewing carcinogens, we are now living at a time where more often than not our government is enabling the people who own the factory. And it's even worse than that because the people who own the factory probably also own the television station and the radio station and the news station and the newspaper that would be even telling you about these things to the point where the whole system has become a political media industrial complex. It is not doing what the declaration says it is supposed to do. We the people have the right to say, uh, we're not going to have any more of that. And it is also true, and I can tell you this because I've been running for president for the last year, they have it all locked up so you can't even express that. However, I want to remind you that abolition, the abolitionists certainly were facing a situation that was all locked up. What'd they do? They unlocked it. The women who were oppressed by these institutional realities by which they couldn't even vote, that situation was all locked up. They unlocked it. The people who had no rights at work, who had no rights when all the wealth was hands in, the, in the hands of the great robber barons of the Gilded Age, that situation was all locked up and they unlocked it. And the people who were living at the effect of segregation and the institutionalized oppression of black people in the American South during the 1960s, they were faced with a situation that was all locked up. They unlocked it. If anyone can talk to you about how locked up it is, I can and I still tell you, hey, let's unlock this thing. Now, you're going to vote on Tuesday. President uh, Biden has already um, achieved the delegates. He is now the Democratic nominee uh, for the presidency. I'm not like ignorant of that, fa of that fact. So I'm not here saying, uh, please vote for me on Tuesday so that I can be the Democratic nominee. Please, I'm rather saying, please vote for me on Tuesday so that they cannot continue to erase me, invisibilize me, muffle my voice, or mess with me. <laughs> because 
because as far as they are concerned and CNN is concerned and MSNBC is concerned, okay, it's all over now. It's all over because the DNC had decided that Joe Biden will be the nominee. We did not have a primary this year. We actually had no primary this year and they remarked that there would be no one. Now, for those of you who are younger, I understand what the PR was, that we have an incumbent. And when you have an incumbent, nobody is supposed to primary him or her. Now, back to those of you who are older. Am I wrong or was Lyndon Johnson not an incumbent? Am I wrong or did not Eugene McCarthy primary him? Am I wrong or did not Bobby Kennedy Sr. primary him? And I want to tell you youngins in here, on behalf of all of those who are older, we didn't think that was weird. We thought it was democracy. special assignation for incumbency in the U.S. Constitution. Not at all. People, uh, primary incumbent senators, people primary incumbent mayors, people primary incumbent congresspeople. But these are all these narratives that are created now. You know, Gabo Mate, I did a, an Instagram Live with him, and he said something very interesting. He said, speaking of himself, he said, I grew up in Hungary. I know what a controlled society is. He said, I'm telling you, this is even more controlled because it is so sophisticated. But the main chains are in our minds. Wake up. You have the power once you realize you're not powerless. Once you pierce the illusion and realize that this thing, we can rethink this thing. When we get rid of the chains in our minds, things begin to happen. Now, like I said, I'm not going to be the Democratic nominee for president, and I'm not here asking that you vote for me so that I can be. But I'm asking you to vote for me so that we can continue to the best of our ability to inconvenience some people who really deserve to be inconvenienced in America today. So. <clears throat> I have said throughout the campaign, on the trail throughout the country, I have said to people, I, I didn't want to go to Washington to fight for you. I noticed that's what the presidential candidates say every year, let me go to Washington and fight for you. That has never been my idea of a good time. So I've never wanted to go to Washington and fight for you. I would say, let me go to Washington so that I can co-create with you a new chapter of American history. <laughs> I was referred to throughout the year as an unserious candidate, not because they really thought I was unserious, but because they knew how serious this conversation is. And so the things that they did not want you to hear, I'm so grateful that you're here to hear them anyway. Because even though these ideas will not go forth, on my part, as a president of the United States, my hope is that they are still here to plant seeds within enough hearts that each of us who feel so moved will carry it from here. They can kill a candidacy. They cannot kill an idea as long as the idea is in our hearts. Roosevelt in a wonderful book if you have never read it. It was written by the American historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. It is called No Ordinary Time. No Ordinary Time, it was referring to a line from Eleanor Roosevelt and it's about Eleanor and Franklin in the 1930s and 1940s. There are so many ways in which our understanding of American history is so helpful and empowering right now. That book very much so because it actually speaks to, uh, to factors very similar and relevant to the time in which we're living now. And Eleanor said to Franklin, amelioration of stress is not enough. We need fundamental economic reform. What the corporatist Democrats represent is they want to help people in their stress. They want to help people who are living at the effect of an unjust economic system. I submit to you, why don't we just end the injustice? It's not enough to simply help people. It is not enough to simply help people ameliorate their stress. And what the corporatist Democrats want to do is to ameliorate people's stress, but only so far that it won't challenge the underlying financial bottom line of their donors. So what's happening today? 
and why the Economic Bill of Rights that I'm about to express to you represents fundamental economic reform is for the following reasons. And I'd like to point out before I start that everything I'm about to say to you is considered a moderate position in every other advanced democracy. We have been so trained to expect too little. We have been so trained to go, oh, okay, that it is absurd. You know, it's so interesting. You could take any two people in this room who don't know each other, and you could say, okay, let's go have a drink after the talk tonight. And I think it's fair to assume that within 30 minutes, it would be known which of you were in therapy, which of you had had traumatizing relationships, which of you had toxic situations and self-care demanded that you form boundaries now, and it, which of you would absolutely not take any further abuse. But when it comes to our collective, particularly political conversation, we have been trained to think like sixth graders. We've been trained to farm out our best critical thought processes. What could be a more abusive relationship than that you tolerate a government that allows carcinogens in the food that you feed your children just so that big food companies who give them so much money can make more money every quarter? What could be a more abusive or toxic relationship than that? Just tweaking things here and tweaking the things there won't fix it. You know, we're living in the 21st century. The 21st century mindset is very different than the 20th century mindset. The 20th century mindset was different than the 19th. The 20th century mindset was very mechanistic. It was a product of Newtonian physics. It's that the government is a big, not the government, the world itself is a big machine. And if you want to change the world, you just tweak the pieces of the machine. That was the 20th century. We've now transitioned into a very different mindset. The mindset that dominates the 21st century is far more holistic and whole person. If you're thinking the world is a machine, you're only looking at symptoms, you're completely not looking, you're ignoring root causes. If you have a holistic whole person perspective, you know that you must look at root causes in order to have any permanent effect on what is happening on the level of the symptom. I also want to point out that Gen Z people are not even 20th century creatures. Many of them were not even born there. And even those who were born there, it was just for a little bit of time while they learned to walk. So 20, uh, 21st century thinking, which Gen Z much more adheres to, is one in which they simply don't understand why they should live their lives at the effect of bad ideas left over from another century. Personally, I agree with them. And if you do that, you realize it's not going to be enough to just fix a symptom here and fix a symptom there. You have to get down to the level of root cause and you have to take on the underlying injustice. A Declaration of Independence, excuse me, an Economic Bill of Rights today would include, number one, universal health care and improved Medicare for all. And improved Medicare for all would also mean eyeglasses, it would also mean hearing aids, it would also mean dental, and it would also mean mental health. I'd, I'd like you to realize, a majority of Republicans as well as Democrats, not as big a majority, but still a majority, want this. The only reason we don't have it, please be clear, Every other advanced democracy and other advanced countries that aren't even democracies have universal health care. You and I have been told that we don't have it because it's complicated. I'm so glad to be here tonight to share with you what we all know is not complicated, it's just so corrupt. It has to do with the institutionalized greed of the insurance companies, and that is all. We have in this country, and I don't, President Biden tweeted yesterday or the day before, that he doesn't consider, and I'm sure somebody wrote this for him, but it's someone who has apparently no knowledge of the policies of the administration. They said that we do not see healthcare as a privilege, but as a right. 
Really? Well, then why do we have one in four Americans living with medical debt? Why do we have 18 million Americans who cannot afford their prescriptions? Why do we have 1.3 million Americans who are rationing their insulin? Why do we have 75 to 90 million people who are uninsured or underinsured? Why do we have 68,000 Americans who die every year from lack of health care? And over half of our bankruptcies are related to medical expenses. No other advanced democracy lives with this situation. No other advanced democracy. But we have that matrix. We have that matrix. So what we should have is universal health care. We should have a complete eradication of the college loan debt using the Higher Education Act. And the reason it's so important to get rid of the college loan debt is because those loans should never have existed. Going back to those of you who are older, going back, going back to those of you who are older, until the 1970s, there was tuition-free college and tech school. There were systems at University of California, University of Texas, University of Florida. All this is is the tentacles of this malevolent strain. Now, I'm not someone who thinks this is inherent in capitalism. Adam Smith, who was the primary architect of free market capitalism, said it could not exist outside an ethical context. But we now have a strain. It is not dysfunctional. It is malfunctional of capitalism, modern capitalism, in which the only consideration, there's no ethical consideration, there's no soulful consideration, there's no moral consideration. The only consideration is fiduciary responsibility to the stockholder class. It's like a heat-seeking missile for where could there be profit? And where could there most be profit? where people are desperate to have something. You have 1.3 million people rationing their insulin that should cost a dollar or be free, as it is in other countries, and it costs what it costs. Why? Because people need it. So let's talk about these kids who are carrying tens of thousands of dollars worth of college loan debt. Now I'd like to talk to those of you who are older in the room. And I'd like those of you who are older to join with me for a moment and just take a moment to think of the person that you were when you were in your 20s. Got that? Could the person that you were in your 20s have been able to handle tens of thousands of dollars worth of debt? Debt is crippling. Debt is crippling at any age. But how would the nervous system of someone in their 20s be able to handle that? And what did these kids do? They tried to pursue the American dream. They were trying to pursue happiness. And this is particularly obscene when it comes to young people of color. Because black people particularly, young black people were told, if you get your education, you'll be able to close the wage gap. This is heinous. So really what has happened here, I've met so many people around the country. Young people, they come out of college, they got the degree, they have tens of thousands of dollars worth of college debt. Then they do the math in their head and they think, how long is it going to take me to get out of this debt? Then they look at how much money they can make in a starting position in the field that they just got educated for. And then they think, at this rate, I won't get out of this debt till my 50s or my 60s, which until you're in your 50s and your 60s, you think is a long time. <laughs> Later, you realize it's just a few days from now, but you don't know that then. So all these young people, all these young people go, I I'm not going to do it. I'm gonna just going to get a job in some field where I'll have a chance of being able to get this burden off my back sooner. And then they go, then why did I even get the education? And they're living with that. So we should completely, you know, I have a, a friend, an older gentleman, he said to me, well, Marianne, the problem is these young people have no respect for capitalism. And I said to him, Maybe if they had some capital. <laughs> All they want to do is get in the game, and you're not letting them get in the game. So just think right now, for just a moment, let's just take the issues of health care and those college loan debts. Think what America would look and feel like, the relief that people would feel if they didn't have to worry about health care. Yeah. And if they didn't have to worry about those college loan debts. We would be a complete, the energy of the country would be completely different. People would be working at jobs they love rather than the main factor having to be a job where I can get the benefits or a job where I can have a chance to get out of these college low debts. And then that same establishment that creates this monstrous reality has the audacity to wonder where the mental health crisis comes from. <laughs> I remember a senator once said to me when I lived in Michigan, 
Ms. Williamson, do you have any idea, any thoughts about what we should do about the mental health crisis? And I remember saying to her, yeah, stop driving everybody crazy. <laughs> Public policy should help people thrive. You want a healthy economy? Help there be happier people. Duh, that's what will expand your economy. It would expand our economy to have universal health care. It would expand our economy to have people out from under the college loan debts. In both cases, people could spend money. People could get in the game. So not only those things, we should also have subsidized child care. And we should have paid family leave. <clears throat> And we should have guaranteed sick pay, and we should have a jobs guarantee, and we should have a guaranteed living wage. We have a minimum wage. We have a minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. A living wage in any major city in the United States is over $20 an hour. We have a third of America's workforce who live on less than $15 an hour, and half of them cannot find a place to live. So we should have a guaranteed living wage. And everything that I just said, those elements of an economic bill of rights, I want to remind you, they are all considered moderate positions in every other advanced democracy. We should also have a fundamental repudiation of the forever war machine, a fundamental <laughs> repudiation. <laughs> have a department of peace, not just a department of defense. Right now, right now we play war games, we should play peace games. Right now we have a military academy, we should also have a peace academy. Right now we have armies of military personnel, we should also have armies of peace builders. I respect the US military. It's the commanders in chief and a few of the things that they've done with that military that I have the problem with. The issue is that I look at the military the way I look at a surgeon. If you have to have surgery, you want to have the best surgeon. And the United States does have to have the best surgeon and the best surgeon on hand at all times. The problem is a reasonable person tries to avoid surgery. And in our society, they do not try to avoid surgery because there is more money to be made on war than on cultivating peace. <clears throat> so just as it's not enough to treat the symptoms of sickness, we've learned we have to proactively cultivate health through nutrition, through exercise, through lifestyle, and so forth, the same is true with cultivating peace. Now, at this Department of Peace, at this uh, Academy of Peace that we would have, I think it's important that we all realize that peace building is an actual thing. It's an actual set of skills and expertise. And I want to point out four factors which statistically mean when present, there will be a higher incidence of peace and a lower incidence of violence. Such common sense. Number one, greater economic opportunities for women. Number two, greater educational opportunities for children. Number three, a reduction of violence against women. And number four, the amelioration of unnecessary human despair. That's how we build peace. You know, uh, Martin Luther King said there's negative peace and positive peace. Negative peace is where there's an underlying tension and anxiety. There's just not an outright expression of violence and conflict. He said that the only way we would have positive peace is if we uh, predicate those things on brotherhood and justice. Right now, we do not focus on brotherhood and justice. Rather, we do not do those things. We create situations in which expressions of violence and chaos are almost inevitable. and the genius mentality that is running our political establishment, their only mode of problem solving in such a case is to build more prisons or drop more bombs. We really need to interrupt this pattern. We also need to discuss the incredible risk to America's children. I want you to know that as I've traveled this country over the last year, I have met public school, elementary school principals 
who have told me they have elementary school students on suicide watch. We have children in America who are traumatized before preschool. To ask about education in America is almost quaint these days. We have to deal with childhood before a kid even gets to something like kindergarten. We now know that the human brain, 90% of it, is developed in the first five years. If we want to have a revitalized, corrected, really sustainable America in 20 years, we need to have a major transfer of resources into the lives of children 10 years old and younger today. That's why we need. <clears throat> one, of, one of my greatest joys as president would have been to convene the greatest experts, the people who know the most about early childhood in America. Everything about it, about the brain, about food, about everything necessary. If you take care of a child in the first 10 years, this society will be okay. What we have now ch is children who are so traumatized that in public schools throughout America, they routinely have trauma rooms. This is one of the reasons we're bleeding teachers. Teachers say, I, this is not what I was educated for, not crowd control, not behavioral symptoms like this. And a few years ago, everybody was talking, started talking about wraparound services and trauma-informed education. I was all excited. This is great. We're talking about trauma-informed education. But it occurred to me one day, shouldn't we deal with the question, what is happening in America that for millions of our children Childhood itself is such a trauma. What is going on here? What we have in America, including in cities like this, is children who go to public schools where they don't even have the resources to, to, to teach a child to read by the age of 10. If a child cannot learn to read by the age of 10, then the chances of incarceration are greatly increased. The chances of high school graduation are drastically decreased. It's that proverbial cradle to prison pipeline. But what happens here is that children are not old enough to vote. They're not a constituency. They're not old enough to work, so they don't have any financial leverage in Washington. And also, when these institutions were created, women had no public voice in any of this. And so children are routinely the collateral damage of unfettered soulless capitalism. I want to tell you something, whether it has to do with the state of America's children or it has to do with those college loan debts, this is insane. You set your young people up to win. You don't cut them off at the knees. Obviously, we have to deal with the fact that no matter whether it's been Democrats or Republicans, our modern presidents have so lined up with big oil that even in a situation like the one we have now, very healthy investments in green energy that are in the Inflation Reduction Act, it's like a purse thief, classic distraction technique. Have everybody all excited about the, it is true, very healthy investments in green energy so they won't notice the fact that we're actually giving more oil drilling permits even than Trump did. They won't notice the fact that we approved the Willow Project. They won't notice the fact that we're doing more to invest in dirty energy than in clean energy. This is one of the reasons why we're losing. The Democrats, for instance, are bleeding young voters. I want to ask a question here. For those of you who are young, if you have ever said this, and for those of you who are older, have you ever heard this? Now, if the answer is yes to my question, I want you to raise your hand, please. And I want you to raise it high, and then please leave it high so that we can all look around the room. Are you ready? So if you're older, if you've ever heard this, if you're younger, if you've ever said this, and this is. Well, under normal circumstances, I would probably be thinking of having a child. But given the state of the environment and the state of the world today, I'm thinking it might not be the responsible and moral thing to do. All right, please keep your hand up. And I'd like everyone to just look around the room. And please hear me when I say this. This is not normal. This is a species shutting down. This is frogs already in boiling water. 
And so if that means a president who will declare a climate emergency, we simply must declare a climate emergency. And it behooves us to allow our hearts to break, remembering that Jimmy Carter, when he was president, he put solar panels on the, on the roof of the White House. One of the very first things that uh, Ronald Reagan did was to remove them. And let's just take a moment to just think about the fact that the presidential race in 2020 is one that actually was stolen. We could have had a world-class environmentalist as president in 2020. There are a million Iraqis who would still be alive and we would be in such a different state uh, in terms of the environment. I really believe we should take a moment and just in our hearts give a real blessing to Al Gore. There's one more major issue I'd like to go over with you, and then I want to wrap this part up and we can talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. It is time for America to end the war on drugs. Now, let's talk about this. It's one of those things that's just normalized, we're not even supposed to question it. In 1971, Richard Nixon established the war on drugs, calling drugs public enemy number one. For those of you who are old enough to remember, and for those of you who don't remember, we're telling you, we're the keepers of the stories and we want you to know, kids, that in 1971, when he did that, once the Watergate scandal occurred, back at a time when illegal things on the part of government officials really was considered like maybe you send people to prison, at that time, some of the people who were sent to prison included a man named John Ehrlichman. And John Ehrlichman, when he got out of prison, was really interesting. He was really transformed, and he spilled the beans about a lot of things. And one of the things that he spilled the beans about was Nixon's inception of the, public, of the war on drugs. He did it knowing, according to Ehrlichman, that drugs were not public enemy number one, and he did it partially as an attack on black Americans. Okay. When I was in college, there were 300,000 people in prison in the United States. Today, there are 2.3 million. The trillion dollars that we have spent on the drug war has obviously not solved the problem of addiction in America. It has, however, greatly exacerbated it. And among other things, it has fed the prison industrial complex because out of those 2.3 million people in America, among federal prisoners, 46% of them are nonviolent drug offenders. There's an even worse racial element to this than you might think, because black Americans and white Americans use drugs at roughly the same rate. But you don't have policemen raiding white neighborhoods looking for drugs. In addition to that, if a black person in America is convicted of a crime, they are on average likely to get a 20% longer prison sentence. So if you want to dismantle the prison industrial complex, one of the things you want to do is stop America's war on drugs. We should treat drug addiction, we should treat drug addiction the way they do in more, to be honest, advanced societies like Portugal, where they treat it as a health issue and not a criminal issue. For the hundred billion dollars that we now spend on the war on drugs, we could be funding a world-class network of drug recovery options. We need a president who doesn't... <laughs> president who doesn't just want a drug czar, we need a president who wants a recovery czar. That is what we need to do. One other thing that this will do for us is it will actually help undercut the power of the drug cartels. Because the drug cartels, the power of the drug cartels feeds on the fact that drugs are such a black market in the United States. It won't completely solve that problem, but it will go far towards putting a dent in it. And it will also give us the resources and the bandwidth to go after the one that we really do need, and we need badly to be able to go after, and that is fentanyl. So I hope that you can see that everything that I've talked about and why I have wanted to continue on these states where I have ballots to get these ideas out there. Candidate suppression is a form of voter suppression. This is not okay. <clears throat> I'm
I'm a big girl and I'll go on with my life and I'll be fine. But we, the Americans, need to know that this is happening. You need to know that there is a, that there is a political media industrial complex. That's why I was blacklisted on CNN. That's why I was blacklisted this year on MSNBC. And that's why, you know, I had last year, I had a uh, CNN town hall. This year, when my poll numbers were the same as Nikki Haley's, according to the mainstream media, she was surging and I was ignored. People with much lower uh, poll numbers and I were given a CNN town hall. I uh, was a kooky, uh, crazy nutcase, told AIDS patients, and I think the city knows the deep lie of this one. I told AIDS patients not to take their medicine, and oh, by the way, uh, I'm a bitch at the office, way beyond any of those zen, equanimous, wonderful, calm men that we know run offices throughout America. If only I could be more like them. I'm so sorry. If only I could be. So. At this point, at this point, we need to know that it is we the people who will keep alive the conversations that need to happen. When Mahatma Gandhi was asked, who is the leader of the Indian independence movement, his answer was the small, still voice within. Mahatma Gandhi said that politics should be sacred. He didn't mean that it should be about doctrine or religious dogma or anything like that. He said it should be a a conversation that comes from the deepest place in our hearts. And that's what I hope you feel we're doing here today. We're going into a depth of meaning and purpose and reality and at a time when American politics is such a corrupted vessel that it is the most shallow of conversations, in which, as I said before, it is simply assumed that you are so easy to play and that we will acquiesce to a system in which our own critical thought processes aren't even allowed. And when we try to express them over and over and over again, we feel that we're, we're, we're hit with a slammed door or a slammed shut window. Now, I know about that slammed uh, door and I know about that slammed window, but I'm telling you as someone who knows, we must not give in to, well, let's just give up. Certainly, abolitionists had painful, traumatized, hopeless days. Certainly the women suffragists had painful, traumatized, hopeless days. Surely that was true of the early labor organizers and certainly it was true of those in the civil rights movement. To be honest with you all, our generation, and when I say generation, I mean the generation of adults. I don't care if you're 18 or 80, I'm talking to you. We need to toughen up, buttercups. We need to stop this business of too many men acting like little boys and too many women acting like little girls. You know, it's pathetic when a child, it's sad when a child doesn't get to experience childhood, but it is equally pathetic when an adult never gets around to being one. We need to stop this habit we have of asking you what your wound is today, what your victimization is today, what your limitation is today. Listen, I wrote those books. I know their value, but we went too far. People went too far with it. <laughs> That's not the stuff we should be coddling in ourselves, and it's not the stuff we should be coddling in each other. The questioning should be along the line of, what great thing are you doing today, and how can I help? And I'll tell you something else. <clears throat> To those who say that spirituality and religion have nothing to do with social justice, their ignorance of history is stunning. When you look at the abolitionist movement among white Americans, it began, it emerged from the early evangelical churches in New Hampshire. Among the women who were leaders of the women's suffrage movement, most of them were religious Quakers. And let's not forget that Dr. King was a Baptist preacher. Faith gives you faith in that which is as yet unseen. You see a locked door and you know there are ethers in which it has been unlocked. You realize that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And you realize that your life, the only reason you were born, is to be a bender of the arc. And that is why we are here. You don't do something just because you have a guarantee of success. You do something because it's the right thing to do. You do something. Everybody is craving for meaning today. And meaning lies in living your purpose, and we all have the same purpose, to be instruments of love, instruments of mercy, instruments of compa uh, compassion in whatever way we can. 
Dr. King said, the, the desegregation of the American South, he said that's the political externalization of the goal of the civil rights movement. But the ultimate goal is the establishment of the beloved community. He said we need quantitative shifts in our circumstances and qualitative shifts in our souls. Ladies and gentlemen, and anyone else, we don't need more analysis. I didn't say anything here tonight you don't already know. I might have said a statistic or two, but I didn't say anything everybody doesn't know. This isn't 20 years ago where like, wake up, wake up. Today, people, I don't think people can even believe what's happening. And I don't think people are apathetic. I don't sense that. I just think people are trying to process this moment. It's like something big happens in your life and you go, wait, I gotta think about this. And that's exactly where we should be. The poet Roca said at a time when you're living with a difficult question. You simply have to live the question. You don't have an answer right away. You know, Americans tempor temperamentally are good with a to-do list. Just tell us what to do and we'll do it. But this is not one of those kinds of moments. A lot has to be dismantled here. It's a whole systems breakdown. It will take a whole systems approach to healing it. But each of us will be guided in our way to the ways in which we can best serve this moment. What I hope you feel that we did tonight, however, is bring us together in a deeper understanding of what this moment actually is. You know, Abraham Lincoln, when the, when the North won the Battle of Gettysburg, that was the decisive battle. Once the North won Gettysburg, it was, it was clear the North was going to win this war and the Union was going to be saved. He went to the battlefield and he had said that the Declaration of Independence was the moral basis of the, of the Civil War. You can't say all men are created equal and have slavery. So he said on that battlefield, in referencing the men who died for the North, he said that they had given their last full measure of devotion so that a government of the people and by the people and for the people would not perish from the earth. My message to you tonight is, it's perishing now. It's perishing on our watch. We are not functionally a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. There are people in power today who would hear that line and call Abraham Lincoln a socialist. We are not functioning as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We are functioning as a government of the corporations, by the corporations and for the corporations. That is the problem on our watch. The problem is not the American people. The American people are fine. I've seen this, I'm convinced more than ever. We're fine, we're as good, as decent, as intelligent, and as noble when called to be are the people in any other country. Not any better, but not any worse either. I see it on your faces here tonight, and I see it around this country. People who are willing to engage in a deeper conversation deeper reflection on the meaning of things and how we might respond to this moment in which we live. The problem is that the people with the solutions are over here and the people with the power are over here. And people with solutions don't have the power and people with the power too often don't really want to hear the solutions because what the people with solutions could possibly do is save our democracy but at this, or our even planet or the species, but at the same time they might undercut the profit-making motive of the donors of the people with power. So what we've got at our time is that the people are fine. If democracy is, is revitalized, we're fine. The problem is we have a sclerotic political system that sits like a lid on top of the will of the people. And the will of the people, we're so, we're so pushed down, so burdened, so many people. You have 39% of Americans living, saying that they are regularly skipping meals in order to pay their rent. We have the majority of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. We have a majority of Americans who cannot afford to absorb a $1,000 unexpected expenditure. We have a situation in which people are, millions of people selling their blood plasma in order to pay their rent. No, the economy is not going well. We saw, we have seen already in this country what happens when you don't offer people more. Franklin Roosevelt said that we would not have to worry about a fascist takeover as long as democracy delivered on its promises. 
The problem is that democracy has not been delivering on its promises. If it were, we would have universal health care. People would not be living under the economic stress that they are. People would have easy access to higher education. People would not be in such chronic economic anxiety. People have said to me throughout this year, Marianne, how could you be doing what you're doing? Don't you know the fascists are at the door? And I want you to be very clear, I've done this because the fascists are at the door. But the problem is they should never... <clears throat> they should never have gotten this close to the door. And at this point, I believe that the way we will have victory over, it's not just one fascist, it's at this point a whole movement, a genuine fascist tendency in this country. And the only way we will dissolve that is by presenting to the American people the opportunity for a real improvement in their lives and in their material conditions. Right now, 20% of us live in an economy that works. That's not enough, because that 20% are like an island and we're surrounded by a vast sea of economic despair. No, the status quo will not disrupt itself. The only way that situation is going to be disrupted is if you and I disrupt it. I felt this last year that a way that I could best be part of that process is to run for president. How you might be part of that process will come to you. I humbly request, I hope that one way that you can help be part of that process is to vote for me on Tuesday. I don't have any illusions. <laughs> I don't have any illusion I'm going to win New York. I know how the system operates. I know how it's rigged. I know you have the only way you can get anywhere near the pinnacles of power in this country is if you have access to huge amounts of money, huge amounts of money. And I know what they do to make sure that you will never have that access. I know how this situation works. But I look at other generations, and they were facing situations no less dire, no less dire, and no more dire than the ones that we are facing right now. We need to identify the problems in our past, but we need to identify with the problem solvers. We have to rise up within ourselves. We don't need more data analysis. We don't need more data collection, but we do need more courage. And in each of our lives, in each of our lives, <laughs> in each of our lives, it will look different. Some of us, it will be in the field of healing. Some of us in the field of the arts. Some of us in the field of the environment, domestic abuse. Whatever the field is where you feel that your heart is called and you can make a difference, each and every one of us have unlimited potential to serve. And I believe that politics is our collective assignment. And I hope you feel that something was activated where it really matters most, you know, and that is in our minds before it's activated in our behavior. So thank you very, very much. Uh, for allowing me to hold this conversation with you. Thank you for the profundity of your listening. I have a motto that works for me. Uh, it might be useful to you, whether you see these things in spiritual terms, uh, uh, religious terms, secular terms, whatever. Do with it what you will, but I can tell you that it works for me. Pray in the morning and kick ass in the afternoon. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, New York. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now let me go over a few items with you and then we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, ask whatever you want to ask. We can go into whatever conversation you want. First of all, I know many of you I know from New York, but I need to make clear a little something. This is a legal issue. Um, it's not an unreasonable one, but it's one for us to realize. If you are on my Marianne2024.com mailing list, which I hope you are, once the campaign is over, I cannot access that list to let you know that I'm in town, for instance. So if you are interested in other aspects of my work, please go to Marianne.com. So the political list is Marianne2024.com. The non-political list is Marianne. Uh, 
just Marianne.com, and I think when all this is over, I'll, you know, then I'm free to just talk about whatever uh, I want to talk about. Um, I hope that you will, if you feel moved to, uh, share. Uh, this is Saturday night. We have until Tuesday. Share your experiences. Share. Uh, go on to my social media. Share it. Share the videos. Uh, do whatever. And I do hope uh, that you will uh, go to the uh, pick up a donation envelope at the end. Put in a couple dollars if that feels true to your heart so that we can continue uh, after this, we will be in uh, Oregon, and we will go to New Mexico, and then we will have wrapped things up. So thank you very, very much. And now, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.